Hi, and welcome to our um, final keynote speech for today, uh, for day one. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, to celebrate Juneteenth. Um, our closing keynote speaker is Aaron Saunders. Aaron started his journey with Clearly Innovative Incorporated as an ally to business entrepreneurs seeking to develop apps. Uh, Aaron quickly realized that there was a significant gap in the business knowledge for many of those entrepreneurs. So he shifted in direction and took action to develop partnerships with the DC Mayor's Office as well as Howard University to provide resources for closing the gap. Welcome, Aaron Saunders. Welcome and thank you uh, for having me today. And thank you for everyone who is listening. Hopefully you find some benefit or some interest in uh, what I have to say about my journey for inclusive innovation incubator. So, um, let's get started. So who am I? Uh, this is me at in sixth grade when I first started to learn to code. That's a uh, Commodore PET. Data was stored on cassette drives and um, that was considered the uh, personal computer. My interest in uh, software development and programming came as I sat in the library as a young kid with nothing to do, that computer sat in a um, box for a month in the library before I asked the librarian if I could open it and they said yes. And I opened it and I, sought my, I taught myself how to code and that began my journey back in a very long time ago. Um, I have over 30 years experience in the technology field, working for large companies, small companies, startups. Um, I also have done some government contracting uh, my first real head first dive in was uh, I worked for e-commerce startup in New York City during the first e-commerce boom. I worked on the first Toys R Us, the first Nike store, Boo.com in Europe, and DisneyStore.com. Um, I transitioned when I came here to D.C. and I worked for large government contractors. I worked as independent um, contractor to government contractors. And uh, one thing I always say to entrepreneurs is you never know where the money's going to come to bootstrap your company. So uh, when I started Clearly Innovative, I bootstrapped that money with uh, the funds that I had saved from government contracting. Uh, I knew that it was time for me to move on. I made a plan, I saved the money and I bootstrapped Clearly Innovative about 10 years ago. Clearly Innovative is a web and mobile development firm based here in Washington, DC um, that I started about 10 years ago. It's an African-American owned company. I'm the uh, sole owner of the company. The, Primary focus of what I wanted to do when I started the company was to provide an on-ramp um, for individuals from a non-traditional background to get into software development. So what, what do I mean by that? I mean, folks who didn't go to college and get a computer science degree and then you know, get into the business. We, we figured out a way and had a pretty good record of identifying individuals who had a passion for technology but didn't have the formal education in technology. Um, we would bring them on at Clearly Innovative. Uh, we would pay them and we would train them. Um, we've, we figured out how to get people billable on client projects in approximately 45 to 60 days um, at our company. There's been a model that we've used for the last 10 years. Um, we've had a pretty decent track record in it. And the, the positive thing that came out of it, it, it gave people an opportunity to get into the tech industry um, when they, as I said, they didn't have that, they didn't have that traditional background. Uh, also at Clearly Innovative Inc., we started a youth tech education company. At that point, the company was called Luma Labs. We started our work with Howard University Middle School for Math and Science, and we created a STEM entrepreneurship program uh, to demonstrate to young kids that there are multiple paths into the tech ecosystem. So it wasn't just a coding camp. We spoke about user interface design. We spoke about team building. We spoke about communication. We spoke about marketing and all of that. Um, that company now is, um, it's still inside of Clearly Innovative and it's called Clearly Innovative Education. The, um, also through that relationship, I ended up teaching at Howard University for about two or three years. I taught in the business school, I taught in the uh, computer science school, mostly web development. I also taught an iOS Swift development course. Um, the, my, my passion and the reason why I really wanted to teach at the university was to kind of bring 
some of the, for lack of a better word, the, the experiences that I had starting my business as a technologist and being able to uh, be a resource for the students beyond just taking them through the academic process of learning how to code or learning how to build something. Um, I taught both of my classes with the um, approach that we still use now at Inclusive Innovation Incubator, which is the primary objective is to just learn how to build something. Um, I made sure that the students understood that this was not a, a class on theory of software development. It was not a class on algorithms. It was not a class on patterns. It was a class on how to build something with the, with the intentional focus of just getting more stuff built and getting um, more you know, black and brown folks creating things. We have a lot of ideas. Let's just start creating things and seeing what sticks and what, what doesn't stick. And then also along my journey, I was able to um, write a book on mobile application development. So, you know, one of the other things I, I say often to folks is that you never know the journey that tech will take you on. Um, I always assumed that I would just be a software developer writing code. And I've been, um, this tech industry has allowed me to get into the education space. It's allowed me to teach. It's allowed me to write a book. Um, it also allowed me to travel to Europe for a year. So the idea that tech is just sitting in a cube and banging something out is something that uh, clearly is not true any longer. Um, I have this slide in here because it's one of the highlights of, of my career. I've been in tech for over 20 years. And um, three, was it three years ago, the Smithsonian National Museum for African American and History and Culture launched. Um, we are their mobile partner. We built the mobile application that is still used at the Smithsonian. Um, we, we came in um, very close to the launch of the uh, museum. We were told that they needed to get an application up and running uh, in time for launch. We needed to support multiple languages. We need to integrate into legacy systems. Uh, I pulled what, we pulled our team together we brought in some contractors to support our work and we delivered a solution. Um, it's, it's like I said, it's one of the highlights of uh, my career and I'm certain all the people that worked on our team. And, and at that point, the critical point that I was trying to make is that there are black people in tech. Um, there are black people in tech that can do amazing things if given the opportunity. And I feel blessed that we had the opportunity to be part of history with that. Um, a little bit more detailed on Clearly Innovative, Aluma Labs. Um, one of the things that we found important when we worked with the students was to make sure that there was a cultural awareness around the way we taught the class. So, for example, um, one, at one point we were teaching the class and one of the, uh, the young women in the class raised her hand and she said, you know, don't you have any women that work at your company? And, you know, I had to step back and realize that we had just been bringing in uh, the guys on my team to teach the courses. So we adjusted, we identified, we brought in some women um, to teach the classes so that the girls in the class could see someone that looked like them teaching. Uh, we also, through my experience uh, teaching at Howard, we uh, were able to identify students who we thought could add value to the work we did at Clearly Innovative. Uh, we hired some of the students as summer interns, we paid them. I don't believe in unpaid internships. Um, and then some of the students, because we are based in Washington, DC, uh, some of the students were able to continue their work while uh, they went back to school. Uh, we already spoke about the STEM initiative. Some of the partners that we worked with, uh, Clearly Innovative, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, we, ran, we were part of a couple of their summer programs. Um, a few years ago when uh, Acto here in DC ran a summer uh, STEM and entrepreneurship camp, we were their partners who ran that program and organized it. Uh, we partnered with Microsoft for events. And a few years ago, the um, we partnered with some uh, young women from uh, McKinley High School here in DC for a, um, a project that they did with NASA. So we are, you know, one of our focuses that we believe is critical is, you know, supporting the next generation of leaders through programs and services and creating the opportunity for them to be aware of what is out there for them. It's, it's not necessary that everyone that goes to our program will be an entrepreneurship, be an entrepreneur or be a developer, but that they're aware that these are opportunities um, that they can pursue if they choose to later in life. Uh, the, the reason why a lot of this 
matters to me is to address, you know, these things that I'm certain most people who, who are here today are aware of, um, the lack of diversity in tech, um, the lack of investment dollars that are invested in diverse companies, the this the huge wealth gap that exists in the communities, which make it a lot, which make it more challenging for us to, um, if if even if given access to these opportunities, sometimes the lack of capital um, make it challenging for us to actually, you know, deliver on um, what we want to deliver to make our dreams come true, and. And then r really as it is, it's, it's the access and the opportunity issues in communities of color. And you know, what could I do from you know, where I am and what we we're doing at Clearly Innovative uh, to have a positive impact here in Washington, DC and then eventually beyond DC. The, 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 the kind of um, inflection point, I think I would say was um, about four years ago when we won a $100,000 grant from JP Morgan Chase. They had a program called Mission Main Street. And what we realized at that point was there was a lot of programming that we were doing inside of uh, Clearly Innovative that really was a standalone business. Um, the working with entrepreneurs that came to us to develop mobile applications, very often we realized that they weren't ready to build a mobile app. There were still some business analysis that need to be done, a better understanding of their customer. Um, and we were kind of doing that consulting as we worked with these entrepreneurs, but that really should have been a separate business. Um, our youth education stuff really should have been a separate business. And the technology training uh, that we were doing at that point, we were running meetups in DC. Um, we were doing our in-house kind of apprenticeship program. And you know we got to the point where like, this is a separate business. Let's figure out how to separate it. We got the $100,000 grant to kind of move forward with it. And so we began the journey of trying to find a physical location to stand up at that point what we were calling Luma Labs. Um, we very quickly found out in Washington DC that $100,000 doesn't really get you that much in physical space. Um, but we were, we, were, we were at the point where we were committed to um, making a difference here in DC. And then that is when the opportunity to run, not to run, but the opportunity to create Inclusive Innovation Incubator came about. Um, Inclusive Innovation Incubator is a public-private partnership between um, my company, uh, In3DC LLC, which stands for Inclusive Innovation Incubator, um, uh, the mayor's office, the uh, Washington DC mayor's office, and Howard University. It is a space, uh, the mayor's office put out an RFP to identify someone to run a space in Washington DC intentionally focused on supporting diverse and underrepresented technologists, entrepreneurs, and creatives. Um, we were literally given a blank slate because the building that you see in this picture had been sitting empty for 10 years. Um, we worked with uh, Howard and the architects to design the interior of the space. Um, as I said, it's about 8,000 square feet of space. There's about 65 to 70 open desks. There's 12 offices inside. Um, there are four classrooms because uh, it was critical to us to be able to continue to offer technology training. Um, and this is where hopefully the magic happens and opportunities created for individuals here in DC. Um, we, we say that our focus is being an innovation space to support a community of high potential technologists, entrepreneurs, creatives from underrepresented communities. I'm in a DC area that's mostly black and brown communities. Um, and uh, in, another side note is that this the project to create a space was part of a report that the mayor's office had put out at that time called Pathways to Inclusion. And they in the report, it had recognized that although the um, overall economy in the city was getting better and there were more opportunities, that the gap between black and brown folks and the rest of the district was kind of widening. Um, and that the mayor felt that there needed to be a space that was intentionally focused on addressing these issues. And, um, you know, clearly we were in agreement with her. And so we felt that the goals were aligned and we were happy that we had won this opportunity to uh, run this space. The, the, um, we, at a, at a base level, try to say we focus on the, the three C's, which we believe create challenges uh, for our target audience. Um, and I'll kind of speak about them backwards from the way I've, they're, they're written there. Um, 
social capital, having a physical space to come to gather, to network, to meet, to talk, um, and dare I say to be a safe space where you know you're gonna walk in and see people that look like you, see, um, come into a space that you know its purpose is to support you, um, we believe was critical. So the first year to year and a half was really built around creating the community of individuals who um, shared our passion for technology and entrepreneurship, who were looking for a place to kind of come and meet and work on these um, challenges together and hopefully find other individuals to support them. So that's the social capital part. And so that was managed through training, programming, events. We partnered with other people in DC to bring events into our space. Um, and so that's a social capital piece. The uh, technical capital piece is far too often I heard entrepreneurs say, I can't find someone to build my website or you know, build my mobile app or to help me with my um, technical challenges that I'm having with my small business. And so the technical capital piece is our focus on tech enabling the community through um, workshops, webinars, programs to train people and to make them more aware of technology and how technology can add value to their business, um, simplify their work so that they can focus on more value added opportunities and not kind of get all you know caught up in things. And to help also, you know, basically help them grow and scale their business. Um, and then the last one is financial capital. Um, there is a wealth gap that exists in the community. There is a lack of capital for entrepreneurs and small businesses that exist in our community. And our goal with these three C's was to create the social capital, which is the network, the technical capital to kind of help these entrepreneurs in the network get the technical resources that they need to build a solution. And then the idea was that we create this dense community of diverse entrepreneurs, which would then draw financial capital to a single spot in the in the district. Um, often we heard, well, I can't find these entrepreneurs or I can't find these developers. And what we wanted to say is that there's a space, there's a space in the district um, that you can come to, that you can support, um, that can give you access to these resources that you need or that you're looking for. Um, I covered most of this. The, the important part here is that um, we, prior to COVID, at the beginning of COVID, that was the start of our, uh, yeah, we were going into our third year at that point. So in about two years, we built a community of about 6,000 um, diverse entrepreneurs, technologists, and creatives. Um, so through that mailing list, we can uh, we can target programming. We can identify what type of programming people are responding to. Um, we can work with our sponsors to give them access to specific um, interests within our audience. Uh, through our actual programs and workshops that we've had in our two and a half in our in our two and a half years, we've supported over uh, fifteen hundred entrepreneurs, technologists, and creatives. These are individuals that have actually sat through programming um, at IN three. And what we what we did about a year ago was in order to um, support individuals who might be interested in sponsoring us and to better uh, categorize the, the content and our deliverable, we kind of come up with these brands on how we push our programming. And so the first one is Grow and Glow. Excuse me. Um, Grow and Glow is our uh, women <clears throat> is our, excuse me is our women's based programming what we do with grow and glow is um, we have programs services workshops networking events that are specifically targeted for women um, the idea is that we leverage our proximity to the university we leverage our relationship with the larger community and we try to bring together uh, the young women, potentially from Howard and other individuals from the community um, to work together on their small business or their technology challenges um, under this brand. The uh, one below that is in three talks. I started a podcast about a year ago to kind of share my thoughts on um, things that I've had identified through my own personal entrepreneurship journey of starting Clearly Innovative, my education program, and then IN3. And then wrap in experiences 
uh, that I'm getting from entrepreneurs that I interact with basically daily. Um, moving along the bottom is the Inclusive Innovation Incubator um, Labs. And so we cut for short, we call that N3 Labs, the Tech Enabled Business Bootcamp. Th this ties into um, one of the things that we've observed uh, through the work that we've done, which is um, the lack of technical co-founders or technical resources to support um, the entrepreneurs that come through IN3. Um, in, the, in the first event that we did, in our first cohort we did last year, we had about 15 companies. These are 15 tech companies that we had. Um, only one of them had a technical resource on their team. So that validated the point that we were making is that there's all these great ideas, but there's lack of technical resources to support them. So in our N3 labs, we cover the same, most of the same material that you cover in other business boot camps. We do the uh, Lean Canvas, we cover marketing, we cover legal, uh, we cover uh, finance, but we make a, we try to do a deeper dive around the, the tech enablement piece. And what we do is we leverage the resources that we have from Clearly Innovative and myself and other individuals from my team who provide you technical guidance on how you could potentially implement your solution so that when you come out on the back end, the idea is that not only do you have uh, not a business plan, but a canvas that you're going to work from, from a business perspective, a financial plan, but you also have a technical plan on how to actually build something, which is a critical piece right now is, you know, I can, decks are nice, but a lot of, um, you really need to have something built. And so our niche in this cold, you know, kind of world of business boot camps and, and pre-accelerators and everything is um, providing that technical capital to the folks that go through our program. And we're in the middle of our second cohort right now. We um, had to shift it to online. We have 18 companies um, that we're currently working with. Um, on Monday, I'll be I'll uh, send out a a, uh, a mailing to uh, let folks you know know who are the companies that we're working for. Our goal also is to kind of amplify the companies that we work for to let folks know that there's a lot of interesting things here happening in the district, and there's some great diverse entrepreneurs that they should know. Uh, the final one is the future is written in code. The Future is Written in Code is our technology training initiative. This is part of the um, tech apprenticeship that we were running, um, some of the curriculum from when I taught at Howard, and just lessons learned as um, we run Clearly Innovative, our, our mobile development firm, um, what are some of the challenges and lessons learned that we're finding as we work with clients? Um, so right now, through the Future Futures Written in Code, um, we are offering a free intro to game development course. Um, the gaming industry is a billion dollar industry. The gaming industry is not as diverse as it should be. We need to have diverse people telling those stories, creating it and having an influence. And so um, one of the things that we've done is create this uh, free game development course. So um, folks from our community can get an opportunity to learn about game development. Um, in the last year or so, we've taught a uh, free React development course. We've taught actually two Vue.js courses. We've taught an Angular development course. Um, so the idea is to kind of go beyond the kind of the basic intro to JavaScript class to allow people to upskill if they want to, or also to get skills to actually build something, or for them to kind of you know get enough um expertise that they could potentially work with one of the entrepreneurs in our community to kind of build out an MVP. Um, so that's what the features written in code is all about. Um, a little bit of a deeper dive here on uh, on our programming. So as I mentioned, um, oh I, I didn't mention right now uh, on our on the on on the on YouTube. Um, we are offering a, a free learn to build mobile apps with Ionic Framework and React.js course. Um, things have kind of slowed down because of the, the um, I don't want to say chaos, but the what's happened the last couple of weeks. So I've, I've kind of fallen behind, but the plan was to drop two videos a week. That if you follow along with the videos, it teaches you some React, it teaches you um, some Ionic Framework, and in the end, you actually have a cross-platform mobile application that can be deployed. The course is online for free. Anyone who wants to come can follow along. The Unity Game Development class is the class I, taught, I spoke about that. Unfortunately, it's too late for that. We're halfway through that class right now. 
but um, also on our YouTube channel, we have posted um, the live stream videos from that class. We previously taught a Swift UI class um, to expose people to iOS development. And as I mentioned, the uh, Vue.js class. You know, it is, we believe a critical component to the work that we do is the technology training. Um, and so, and also because I, I love technology, I love teaching. So um, that, that's why we push, push a lot of this out. Um, we're currently trying to figure out how to do um, some online uh, coding to target the K through 12, our youth education uh, program over the summer. Uh, but, you know, we'll see how that goes. These are challenging times for everyone. Uh, this is the the um, the website, the futures written in code. There's a bunch of content there. Please check it out. Please support it. Um, a, a backstory on that is um, when I was trying to pull content together for some of the other program that we did, and I go on, I went on YouTube and I started searching mm -hmm. for content. Um, one of the things that I found was I didn't see a lot of people that looked like me, kind of showing up. Uh, presenting valuable technical content on learning to code. And so uh, that was one of the reasons why I doubled down and I've been kind of more aggressive with posting uh, content online, specifically on YouTube around uh, technology training. And also when I'm online, I search to find other diverse um, content creators in the space that I, I uh, like to subscribe to and support because I think there needs we need to have better representation on YouTube in this specific vertical. There's a bunch of other interesting content on YouTube um, from people of color, but I really want to see more, you know, black and brown technology content online um, getting promoted and, and moved up. Um, one of the newest things that we started last year was uh, in three gaming, and this kind of ties into the game development course that we I offered. We held a large event with Microsoft about a year and a half ago, um, really to raise awareness in in our community about uh, gaming. Gaming is a billion dollar industry. Um, as I mentioned, gaming is not that not that diverse, and it's. It's the same, my, my opinion on gaming is the same way the entertainment industry needs to have diverse people involved telling diverse stories and giving diverse perspectives. I believe the gaming industry needs to have the same thing. I think even more so, based on what we've seen during COVID, um, pe the, the amount of hours people have spent playing video games, streaming, watching content on Twitch and Mixer and YouTube is tremendous. And it's not only a business opportunity, an entrepreneurship opportunity, it's, um, it's an opportunity for individuals who like gaming, but are in other fields and, and are always looking ready to, sorry, are always looking for a way to kind of, you know, take something they're passionate about and apply it to a field that, they're, that, uh, that they love. Um, so the, the idea here, is to move from consumers to creators. And there's a question, um, I, I'll talk about volunteering at the end and the game development course is being taught with Unity. Uh, there's information on the N3DC website about it. And then also I can, at the end, I can post the, the link to the specific YouTube channel where the courses are posted, uh, where the live streaming from the courses are posted. Um, so before um, COVID hit, we had we were hosting gaming game tournaments. Um, we had done a Madden, we done a Madden tournament. We done some NBA 2K tournaments. We did some. I'm closing my eyes. I'm trying to think. Some Smash Brothers tournaments. Um, the the idea was to kind of bring those communities of gamers together, but then also talk about the entrepreneurship opportunities that were available. Um, it's. I talk to a lot of people about gaming, and it's very often people are just surprised how much money is being made in that industry and the opportunities that exist there. And you know, the same way that I put the effort into tech to get people excited about tech, um, I want to put that same effort in into the gaming industry, so that you know, hopefully, when my my kids are older, because both of my kids game, um, and when they look at um, video games or when they look at um, you know, who's reporting on gaming, um, who's, who's experts on gaming, that they see people that look like them. 
I think that the gaming industry needs to um, reflect the people that spend a lot of time with it. Um, so that's what this push is within 3 Gaming. Um, I covered most of this. We, we have uh, the work that we're doing, the panels and workshop to raise awareness and opportunity. And then I, I think we're wrapping up now. Um, so what we're, so the, the plan for IN3 is that um, we currently have one location here in Washington, D.C. Um, prior to uh, COVID, we were um, working on a plan to expand to multiple locations. And we're still trying to figure out kind of what our next step is now, like a lot of other um, companies. Um, but also part of our expansion was the uh, creation of In3 Nation as an online platform. The idea was that we will, will take content that is created through Grow and Glow, um, In3 Gaming, The Future is Written in Code, and some of the other workshops that we have, and we would provide access to that content online through the In3 Nation platform. The N3 Nation platform is just an extension of our physical locations um, to be an online community also. Um, so like most of the communities you see that have chat boards, um, chat boards, job information, we would also push the educational component um, in the N3 Nation platform. And along with that, um, members, because it would be, it'd be a freemium model, there'd be some some paid stuff and some stuff for free, uh, members would also get specific access to our physical locations for potentially um, using a conference room, classroom, need a desk space or any of those services that the physical location provides. We're also working on extending the Futures Written in Code brand. Um, we are working on, if anyone's interested, we are working on creating a, um, a Futures Written in Code developer days uh, here in Washington, DC. Um, I've been in tech for a very long time. Um, it's very rare that I see someone that looks like me on the stage talking about tech. I know that there are people that look like me in the industry and the develop the Futures Written in Code Developer Days, the plan is to um, host it at IN3. Um, we have enough space, we have classrooms, so we can have breakout sessions, we can have talks. And it, this is this will be a tech event, a not a tech adjacent event. There will, it will be bring your laptop, learn to code, Let's dig in deep on technical stuff. Um, we're also working on um, adding more curriculum to our Futures Written in Code, having more online content, and also a lot of that content will get pushed to the Three Nation platform also. Um, so we will also start to generate um, eBooks out of the uh, courses that we're offering. So for example, we taught a Vue.js class during the winter. At a time, I took all my curriculum and all the notes and everything and pulled it together. Um, before editing or cleaning up, it turns out to be about a 125-page ebook. So the idea is to come in, clean up that content, package it up together, and you know figure out ways to kind of generate revenue from that content. This is um, the end. Here's some links, and yes, I am now ready. Uh, for questions after I take a sip of water. Hey there, Aaron. Thank you again so much uh, for this uh, extremely insightful um, information that you've shared here with us. Um, I, I think our audience will be pleased to know that the progress that your team is making. And, and one of the key questions I think which you've already answered or you're gonna answer is like, how do we get involved? What are some of the things that we can do uh, to get involved and to help with this movement? I mean, one of the most important things is, you know, first of all, thank you, you know, for adding me to, to this conference. I mean, I, it's, it's bewildering to me that there's still people, like we've been there for June, at the end of June will be three years. We've been there for three years in DC. Um, and I still run into people who were like, oh, I didn't know you were there, who just mm -hmm. had no idea that we've been here. Um, and so if, if nothing else, I ask that uh, just folks just amplify, just talk about the work that we're doing. Um, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, you know, subscribe to um, 
subscribe to us on social media. If you're planning on having an event in DC, consider hosting your event at, at IN3. Um, you know, one of the, as I mentioned, our biggest focus is kind of building this community of entrepreneurs. Like one of the things that I think is critical and one of my frustrations that I see, um, and I even, unfortunately, I even see it happening now, is that when people say, hey, I want to invest in black entrepreneurs, they want to pick a black entrepreneur and say, I'm going to invest in that entrepreneur. But most then they're like, a, they're, they're like on an island, right? Mm -hmm. There's no ecosystem to support them, right? There's no Absolutely. ecosystem to cultivate more entrepreneurs like that. And so there needs to be a balance between trying to pick the individual entrepreneur to invest in and invest in the ecosystem to support, cultivate, and grow more entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I think, no, go ahead. So one, one of the analogies that I use often is, um, and I actually just read another article about it, for anyone who follows baseball, right, there are a tremendous number of Dominicans in baseball. Right. Mm -hmm. Every major league baseball team has invested heavily in the Dominican Republic. There are baseball camps. There, are, there's a whole infrastructure to grow and cultivate, identify high potential talent, mm -hmm. which they can then bring to the professional leagues. Right. If you map that analogy to entrepreneurship, business creation, economic development, right? It's like you need to invest in the ecosystem to kind of get the value out of it. And so that's really what we're trying to do here. Um, so to me, my goal is our hard work and someone ends up going to Y Combinator or some other great, you know, um, accelerator incubator, like that's a win for me. You mm -hmm. know, that's how I look at it. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, I think the awareness that that ecosystem needs to be developed, you know, like you said, the analogy of someone really being pulled in and, and, and a company or individual saying, I want to invest in you, but you're on an island, you know, so creating that and, and being aware first that you need to create this team in order to drive this forward. You really right. need to build up that talent. And so I love what you're doing with it. So for you, I mean, the, the answer is more of get involved, right? Like reach out to your organization or any other organization. Yes, yes. And, and you know, the, the other thing is, um, even if you work for like a large company, large companies have corporate social responsibility dollars, large companies have um, specific groups inside. So if you're in a company, your company right now is saying, you know, Black Lives Matter, Juneteenth, yay, go, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they're in the region, you could say, hey, I know a place in D.C. that's that is what they do. Like I was actually thinking about it today. It's like. I wake up every morning and go to sleep every night thinking specifically about how I can have an impact on this community. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I. And and I, I feel blessed that I have clearly innovative, which I was able to, you know, Unfortunately, I had to take the profits out of that company to keep in three afloat, right? And very often what you find in our communities are that there are folks trying to do good, trying to make a change, but they don't have the financial support that they need to move forward, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what I ask for folks who are on listening that work, as I said, I work at companies, companies that, you know, are saying they're committed to change and committed to supporting diversity, inclusion, and tech is... You know, have them give me a call. Have them take a look at the work we're doing. Um, the amazing thing is that because we're a small organization, we are extremely flexible, right? There's no hierarchy that you need to go through to get approval. Um, you call us, we sit down, we have a sponsorship package, we discuss it, and we just execute a program. It, right. It's really that simple. And it's very transparent. You can see the impact of your money. Um, and, you know, that's, that's really what it's about for us. That's awesome. That is awesome. Uh, we had another question about gamifying positives of diversity in tech. What are your thoughts on that? Um, creating some type of gamification around that to educate uh, people on the, the needs for diversity or what diversity even looks like through gaming. I mean, I think that's a, an awesome idea and it comes back to the whole idea of building the community, right? So it's, it's you build this community of gamers 
the creatives, people who have the ideas, the people who know how to build the stuff, the people who know how to write the story, whatever. And then they come together and do these things, right? I, I look at, like when I first started, someone asked me, well, Aaron, like, what are you doing? Like, you run a software development firm, right? What I look at it is that I'm just the connective tissue or a facilitator of individuals to have a space to come connect and do things. And given um, funds that we have for our programming, hopefully we're creating programs that help catalyze those connections and make things like that happen. So whoever asked the question, I'm happy to sit down and have a conversation about that. Maybe mm -hmm. potentially connect them with folks who are taking some of our, ga our game development course right now and see if that might be something they're interested in. Um, another thing that we could do is, um, we do this all the time. People ping me about ideas and I'm like, hey, let's do a talk. You know, I have a space, <laughs> right? Come on down, let's set up a workshop. We'll promote it through our 6,000 person mailing list. Um, we'll have people come in and, you know, that's the community part of what IN3 is doing. Love it, love it. A um, couple more questions came in. What engine do you use for game development courses? We're using, um, I think we're using Unity. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, and let's. And I, I definitely want to address this: Are are we open to accepting older entrepreneurs in our developer programs? Right. So, I am fifty six years old. Right. <laughs> so, the, I have I that's I am not about that. I am not about that. Oh, you're too old. I, I don't I don't buy into that. I mean, we don't have much time, but I'm I'm on one of my in three talks. I'm about to do a rant on on exactly that issue. I mean, I love the the energy and the focus that I see coming from my black brothers and sisters, but in my, there's a heavy emphasis on millennials yes. and, and, you know, there are older black folks that might not be as hip as cool or whatever as the millennials, but there is value in experience. There yes. is value in networks. There is mm -hmm. value in relationships. And so the question is, how do you bring these two communities together to do powerful things, right? So we, there is no age limit on, the, our, our any, on any of our programs, right? Our programs, um, every program that we had was free, is, was um, promoted through our mailing list. Um, you sign up for it, you come to the class. It's, it's literally that simple. Awesome, awesome. Um, what do you think of the stereotypical, stereotypical characters in games? This is a very interesting question. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I think that, I think that there needs to be more work. I'll leave it. It's the easiest way to say it is, I think there definitely needs to be more work done in that space. And I mean, mm -hmm. that's part of the reason that we're doing the work that we're doing within three gaming is that, so one of the things that, that I recognized is another thing we're trying to, we were we were planning on doing with Intrigue Gaming was creating our own um, uh, gaming league, right? Um, and the the strategy was to use the gaming league as an on ramp to STEM and our entrepreneurship. We were going to start with uh, we as I said we ran youth summer camps. We were going to incorporate gaming in our youth summer camps, so we get the kids to come because they're interested in gaming but we talk about entrepreneurship and technology from the aspect and the perspective of gaming, right? Mm -hmm. So then as when people see that, I don't wanna say it's easy, but when people see there are different entry points into the industry, right? That's how you get more diversity of thought, more diversity of stories and more diversity of characters, right? Yes. Um, yes. If, I don't know if, if this person who asked the question has been following any of the esports leagues now. I mean, you look at the people who are involved, and there's not a lot of people that there's not a lot of black people that black and brown people that are involved, and you know that needs to change. So, you know, I, that's definitely something I'm I'm happy to talk about. We've had some panels on it. I speak about it a lot during my um my in three talks, and that's also a shout out. If there's anybody here that works at a gaming company, right? Mm -hmm. It's like there's ways to direct those dollars into the community to have an impact, right? Um, and they give us a call. You know, we're happy to do it. You know, that's you know, we when we hosted our game events, 
in our game tournaments, um, you know, we'd get about 40, 50 people that would show up for our game events. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a limited budget. We didn't have any backing from any major, you know, you know, game company um, right. to support us. But these are the things that this, I was, I tweeted today. It's about outcomes over optics. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. You know? I don't think we can say that enough, right? <laughs> I don't think we can say that enough. That's awesome. The, 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 the discord group, every, so everything is IN3DC on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. It's all IN3DC. IN3DC. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Um, let me just check really quickly to see if any more questions came in. And uh, okay, I think we are caught up on our audience questions. Um, I have one final question for you because I just think like tying this all together this entire day has been about celebration, mm -hmm. education, and really bringing uh, to the forefront, you know, some of the things that's going on in our community that we don't know. Like um, it hasn't been so much on the history, but more so on, you know, what's going on. So I love the, your talk. I, I really um, will definitely check out your websites and encourage my friends to do the same. Um, one thing you mentioned is the end of, you mentioned like you bootstrapped yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Um, how difficult or challenging was that? Right? That's like really what, are your, what was, what is one tip that you would give to someone who's doing that today? Um, if you're married, make sure your wife or husband really, really loves you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, 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 I saw someone else speak about this the other day. You know, entrepreneurship is hard. Yes. Um, small business, and you know, I'll even throw that away. Running your own small business is extremely hard. You know, I pre, as I mentioned earlier, I wake up thinking about this, and I go to bed thinking about this. Um, you know, it's you. You need to definitely be prepared to make not only the physical sacrifice, the mental sacrifice, and usually um, a financial sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, to find the success that you're looking for, and which is critical. I did want to say one more thing before we run out of time, and uh, that touches on what you're saying, and that is the what I'm seeing happen now with the Black Lives Matter and the big push to support you know people of color is a lot of money going into social justice causes, mm -hmm. right, and. I think that is great, um, but to kind of break it down, it's like, so now I'm not gonna get beat up and strangled and shot, right? But I still can't get a bank loan, right? I still can't get support I need for my small business, right? So all of these other challenges still exist. And so I encourage people to, you know, talk to their companies, talk to their friends, talk to their peers, that it's like, look, there's social justice and there's economic justice, right? Mm -hmm that it ties back to what I was saying about supporting these, um, was, I call myself an ecosystem builder, right? We can put all, you can't continue to just pump all the money into social justice when there's all these other challenges that exist. There's educational issues, there's like, I mean, so the list goes on and we need to be aware of all that and not get, you know, as, as, I, as I say, you know, we can, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Right. Mm -hmm. We're black people, we're pretty resourceful, you know? Yeah. So yes, we want you to, you know, we want equal justice, but we also want equal ec economic opportunity and equal education opportunity and equal health opportunity, right? And so we need to make sure that we're focusing on all these things simultaneously. Awesome, amazing. Thank you so much again, Aaron. I have a page full, two pages full of notes here. I appreciate your talk today. I think we have Michael waiting to close this out. Um, but again, really do appreciate it. I know the resources are gonna be shared. I'm not sure if someone's sharing that in the chat, but anyone who's looking for information on how to get in contact with Aaron, how to find out more about his business, there we go. The links are again being shared there. Take a screenshot um, of the picture. And anyone can hit yeah. me up. Um, also just to let you know, I'm usually pretty open to 30 minute um, you know, just chats with people. So if you ping me, I'll send you a link for a 30 minute um, calendarly uh, Zoom chat.
if anyone just wants to talk to me more about the work we're doing. Awesome. Great to know. Thank you again so much, Aaron. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, Michael, there we go. How are you? Pretty good. I think I'm um, backlit, so I'll turn yes, on. Yes, you are just a little bit. Um, look like you have some really beautiful gray skies behind you. So <laughs> um, this has been an amazing day, honestly, from start to finish. I think with our opening keynote from Danny all the way up through Aaron, it has been filled with so much uh, wisdom, so much information. I know myself personally, I've gotten a lot from it. I've taken probably five, six pages of notes here just for me to go back and reflect on. Um, I know you wanted to close out, but before you do that, I want to ask, is there one thing that you felt today was just a major, you know, aha moment or a major something that you want to emphasize um, for the folks? So what's interesting, and I'm going to address that in my closing notes, is that almost every talk could have been about the conference itself. Um, are you talking? No, I'm not. It's slowed down. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, almost all of these talks could have been about how this conference was was uh, initialized and started itself, you know, from um, imposter syndrome, representation, journaling, uh, dealing with gatekeepers. I took a few notes as, as I was watching. I, uh, I unfortunately had to pick a stream because there was so much content, we uh, we couldn't do it in just one string. Uh, but um, I think just the feedback that I've been getting off of this uh, is just the realization is that this was very and dearly needed because we didn't have it before. There there are other, like I said, other black black technology conferences and other uh, resources. But I think, like I said, my idea was to make to take this celebration that's already in place and and take this movement that is going on and bring us together and um, make a make a new platform. And that's that's one major point I want to bring that this Juneteenth conference is not just a one day event. It's a year round event and it's a platform, a community that we're we're uh we're definitely focused on building. You know, people are asking, well, why wasn't this here before? You know, we're going to amplify and we're going to build out and we're going to bring the community together. Um, one thing I always say is we should stop banging on these doors that are closed to us and open our own. It's fine. I'm not, I'm not anti Microsoft or anti Apple, Google, Facebook. Well, maybe Facebook, but, um, <laughs> But go there. You know these are premier companies. We can learn. We can we can push them further in their in their uh, efforts to uh, be more diverse and inclusive. Um, but we should also focus on building our own supersized company, technology companies, opening doors for each other and promoting each other. So um, that's the big vision for what we're doing here. Uh, Juneteenth Conf to me is our inaugural ball for the organization that we're forming to uh, to basically promote technology careers for black people. You know, there are students who are 10 miles away from where I live. My girls get, get, um, get to take home laptops when we transitioned to to uh, online learning, they already had the materials they needed. The school just lets them take them home. And of course, you go across the, across the river to Seattle or across the lake to Seattle, and those type of resources aren't there. We are severely, severely underserving black students in inner city communities. And I'm going to step on my soapbox for a moment. This is intentional. The move to support to supporting school funding through localized districts 
was a way to skirt around the Brown versus Board of Education ruling by the Supreme Court because the schools were no longer segregated. It's just based on where you're living. Well, at the same time, we had redlining and black people weren't allowed to even buy houses in these expensive, these new developments. Even you read stories about veterans coming home and being refused to, to buy, buy a house with that new veteran benefit of, uh, of, excuse me, of uh, home financing through the VA. People who served and put their lives on the line for this company were told that they are not enough to buy a house because you're black. So those two combined to make school districts districts where, where I came from just a year ago in Katy, we, we spent, I think it was 75 million on the football stadium. And you go into Houston and the schools don't even have individually a, a single school that, that has that much dedicated to them, let alone a football stadium. So this, this um, segregation that continues, um, more black people are moving into suburbs and, and are realizing the benefits. They're doing studies where it's not about your race, but it's about the opportunity given to you and that when black people come into these communities, into these into these uh, enriching school districts, they succeed. That double hump is not about race. That double hump we see in 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 education and and results is because of impover impoverishment. Chicago is a perfect example of how red lines and segregation has created a ghetto ghettoized and impoverished inner city. Oprah Winfrey did a, did a special where she brought school students from Naperville where they had Olympic sized swimming pool to, to swim in every day versus Dunbar, Dunbar Vocational School where their swimming pool was empty and dirty and unmaintained. They couldn't even use it. So I am so honored that when I had this wild idea to let's do do this conference, like I said, at first I, I didn't even think it would be possible to do it this year, but I reached out. I wasn't, I had imposter syndrome. I didn't know if I could even do this, but I reached out to people. I put a call out to the universe and the universe responded in kind that this needs to be done. The platform that I was given by Microsoft is what enabled this to happen because so many people responded internally. But it's not just Microsoft. There were a lot of ex external respondents, speakers who, I mean, this this lineup, this content of speakers that that we had today was just outstanding. I knew I knew Danny Thompson had a great story to tell as the as the originator of the Hundred Days of Code movement. But I was floored. I was astounded. He he preached. He took us to church. And if you if you missed it, go back. We'll have the videos up. You can go back and watch them later. But just what happened was that I had this thought, and rather than sinking in my my own self doubt, I said, "Let's just do it." I put up a landing page where I collected names. And people signed up and it encouraged me. I put out requests for people to help me bring this to life. And people showed up and showed out and made this, made something that so many people with experience in event planning said, oh, no, we take it. We take a year to plan events like this. We did it in two weeks from start to finish, from inception to finish. And it's, this result is beyond my wildest dreams. And it's because of those volunteers and you, you in the community who, who said, yes, we want this. We have over 2,000 registrants on our, on our site and so many more showing up in the live stream. So I'm, I'm getting contacted by so many people uh, about what we're doing 
and this is just the start of it. So um, I wrote down some notes and I'm going to riff on them. So forgive me if they're a little uh, up here and there. So first, um, one thing that happened while I was while I was making this announcing and building this idea is that I was afraid to make a black space. I was afraid to say this conference is for black people and for black representation and for uplifting black technologists. I you I admit myself I use weasel words like underrepresented people in technology and I was called out on that by black women put a pin in that, I'm going to talk about this more. We need to support black women more as black men. We need to support black women more as a country. Um, I was called out on this and and I, I made a, a, a pivot based on what that concern was raised to me. And I said, yeah, you know what? Juneteenth is a black black celebration, and our conference should be a celebration of black excellence. And I changed our words, and I embraced it, and it was so enlightening for me. This fear of making the black space it somewhat blossomed from what kind of legal ramifications would be by us saying this is for black people. Will someone weasel in and say, hey, you know, that's racist. That's against the, the federal federal guidelines of, of inclusion, or I didn't know what kind of exposure. And frankly, right now, I don't care because this this movement, this shift that we made to 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 be unapologetic, unapologetically black has created all the more support and and representation here. Um, I talked about imposter sy syndrome in, uh, earlier in, in, in the conference. There was an entire track about it. Uh, imposter syndrome comes from a number of elements and particularly, uh, particularly Black people feel it more than um, other races because, you know, the uh, the effect of of positioning affirmative action as giving spaces and quotas to black people who don't deserve it. I, uh, I got accepted to Williams College out of high school. And believe me, <laughs> I had to bust my butt off to, to, get, that, to get, that, get that spot in the school. So even while I was there, I felt what if people look at me and say, oh, he's only here because he's black. He wouldn't have got in otherwise. And you see, you see, this went all the way to the Supreme Court from a student who didn't even qualify to attend UT, let alone was was at a level where anyone was promoted above her based on their grades, based on their their um, their skin color. This went all the way to the Supreme Court to say, "Hey, this is why." why affirmative action is wrong. And it wasn't even about affirmative action. She didn't qualify. She was offered a path into the school based on, you know, go to go to another school and we'll let you into UT if you do well. So it was maddening that all of these cries of reverse racism, and that's what made me afraid at first to, to call this a black conference, was that I didn't want to deal with that. And then I thought about it. I don't care because they're going to say that anyway. Okay, representation in, in technology. That also contributes to our imposter syndrome. If you don't see yourself there, represent it. You can't see yourself there. If there and, and part of this conference is is to give representation. We have a stellar, again, amazing content, all delivered by Black people who are who are saying, "Yeah, you belong here." Shut out all the haters and 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 do what you do. do. Um, I had an interview with with a intern candidate 
who mentioned to me uh, that I was the first black person he had seen during his entire candidacy. And this was for a uh, for an interview for 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 a company I work for, worked for or work for maybe. And you know that 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 just blew me away. And then I looked around and I said, "What's and these numbers are available publicly? What's the black representation here?" And throughout technology, it's abysmal. You see things like two percent, three percent, and even worse at the manager level. So how can how my thought on that is how can I pave the road so that the next next person behind me won't have to deal with those issues of representation and imposter syndrome going forward as well. And I'm getting incredible support from leadership to do just that. Uh, of course, there are also gatekeepers. We talk about it at, on, in tech in general. There are people who think that because they can, they can code well, that they're above you. Prove, prove to me that you, you belong here. And that's especially difficult in the open source community where people are saying, how can I fit in and get, get my foot started? So you've already got the gatekeeper based on technology. And then there's an extra hidden bias that, hey, this new guy, you know, he might not cut it here. And compound it with uh, representation. It's going to be it's going to be fearful for them to step up and make those first steps. Again, this platform that we're building right now will help with that. We will invite people in into the fold. We will tell them that you know, if coding isn't your thing, there's digital design, there's project management, there's so many other pathways into technology. And that's a message that hasn't been delivered well. And I think we should sponsor, focus on delivering that message. Um, so another problem in our space is a celebrity activist. And I'm not talking about specifically for me, but there are, there are many people who will promote the cause and support the cause for their own glorification. And they get away with this. They keep saying, we're going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to build this big old platform and everyone's going to be uplifted by it. And they fail it time and time again and keep getting money to do it. You all know who I'm talking about. We need to stop it. That's why I want this platform to be for us, by us. Finally, uh, I want to talk about our sponsors and our, our attempt to reach out to people. Um, we took a very, once we started looking at sponsorship, which was very late in the game because we were just trying to get, get this up and running, uh, we wanted to do it in a very concerted way without just taking any and all money and letting, letting them use our platform for their own promotion. Many of our sponsors that we reached out to also expressed this concern. They didn't want to make this, this event about them and, not, and they didn't want to uh, have the perception that they were trying to uh, capitalize on this movement that we're doing. So we thank them for for thinking it through and thinking about those, those, those concerns. We've talked with them and, and they're, they're, they're in conversations with us about uh, providing donations to the organization and sponsoring us in the future when they have more time to vet the opportunity to, to be a part of Juneteenth Con Conference. Okay, finally, I want to talk about uh, about our fundraising. Uh, all donations that are made through through Eventbrite for the conference 
75% of it will go to our volunteer speakers and our volunteers behind the scene. Again, like I said before, uh, if we're talking about promoting black excellence, we should talk about promoting black, black pay. Uh, they should not be, they should not bear the labor of making this very successful event without compensation as much as well as as well as we can do. 75% of donations will be distributed to them. They can choose to uh, donate it to their own charity of choice, or they can choose to convert it to cash and, and use it as they see fit. But I believe they should be compensated for what they're doing. 25% of the do donations will go toward the organization and building the platform that we are trying to make, uh, promoting STEM to black students, promoting STEM to other people. We're still in the process of forming, but the donations are being held on us, on our behalf by the DC Tech com Champion community. And we thank them for that, that support they've given us. We've had such an incredible turnout Last, last night, our, our tech manager told us that we had over 5,000 visitors in one day, and that's after just two weeks of promotion. We've had over 2,000 people sign up to uh, join our community. We've had so much response on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and as figurehead, we got interest from, from journalists who who reported on us on Business Insider, as well as on Afrotech. And this is just the start of our movement. I want to make this where the next generation of future STEM and technology people have a guided path to a, to a wonderful career and who can build our, our platform even further. So, I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, show the team behind this. And I will take a moment to uh, share, the, share the screen. And say hi to the... Say hi to the group uh, behind the conference. Is everyone here? Can can you see us on the? Okay, so these are just some of the people I was able to gather together to to provide a uh, to provide provide a quick representation of of the team. Uh, Hank Bowman down below is our tech lead. Uh, he, he put together this platform so that we could uh, bring the event to you. Tess DeStefano is the lieutenant. She, she made sure everything was in line and kept me in order as well. <laughs> it, it allowed me really to focus on the big picture and do the things that only I could do while uh, letting the team, uh, keeping the team focus on what they can do best and removing roadblocks for them. Uh, and well, Labrina was responsible for herding dogs <laughs> as well as, uh, as well as uh, um, bringing in uh, social media and uh, speakers. Uh, I will. I, those are just a few highlights of it. Kotisha has been an amazing host all day on track one. Uh, I, I love to see her continue hosting the content that we'll be delivering post conference. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. I can I can say that even if I didn't name someone, those are just highlights, but everyone has been amazing and we would not have succeeded without an incredible effort by all of them. I am so appreciative of you all. 
Um, like I said on Twitter, you know, my job was to take all the blame for the for the for the missteps because, you know, the buck does stop here, but it's not about saying what gets done or not. It's about who takes the blame for for when 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 I made a decision that turned out wrong. And you know, true leadership is about that. You know, given given all the credit due to the people who supported this and taking all the blame for for the for the missteps because at the end I am the one who made those decisions that got criticism. Oh, I can't forget Josh Holmes. So you want to know how we got this done? In two weeks, we leaned heavily on people who had event planning experience. Josh has done many events, uh, both inside and outside of Microsoft, and his guidance and support helped us make this happen. Um, again, the, the one thing that definitely made it possible was that I, I just did it. I put something up, even though it was janky and, and and obviously, I'm not a, a designer. If you saw our first page when we first went up, it it was just something to capture capture people who were interested. And if I had missed out on that, um, I would have missed out on a lot of quality volunteers. Valerie, uh, I there's so much running through my head. I can't tell what everyone did. But Valerie was always there, always helping, always moving things along, and everyone was as well. Uh, uh, I also like to thank uh, uh, the celebrity actors who uh, who you saw it be before every session, uh, who who graced us with her voice and and beauty. I'm not, I have a face for for radio, so. <laughs> So she uh, she took the front on welcoming everyone to to the conference and and making making sure everyone was aware about the resources that we have here. Uh, I am so amazed by the turnout. I am so thankful that so many people have uh, have aligned with the message, with the mission that we're having. Uh, this is just day one. The videos will be available later, and we look forward to seeing you guys, you, everybody tomorrow. I'm, I'm trying to get rid of my um, my southern dialect. <laughs> We're looking forward to seeing everybody back tomorrow, and bring a friend or two. Thank you so much, and have a blessed day.